Although Peter Singer gives 30% of his income to charity, but he's got tenure. <laughs> These are tough questions. I don't have the answer to them, and no one, I think, does. And I think Paris is a little, little outside the, certainly outside the philosophical mainstream to suppose that science can determine human values. The hard problem of consciousness, this is probably my favorite puzzle around. Consciousness, the feeling of pleasure and pain, uh, sensory, uh, sensory feelings, um, sight, vision. You are aware that you've got these feelings and sensations. Consciousness, we don't have a good science-based naturalistic story of why we are conscious. How does consciousness fit into the natural world? There's no received answer to that question out there. It's an extremely difficult question. I invite everyone to take a crack at what is called the hard problem of consciousness. Okay. What is your tough question for naturalism? Thanks. <laughs>
But as far as the infinite regress goes, uh, I think we have to simply leave that question aside and, and know and, and be probably mystified. Uh, I certainly don't have answers for why, for instance, there's something rather than nothing. Philosophers explore this question. I haven't looked into it too deeply. As far as there being an ultimate cause, well, you're, fi you're free to speculate, of course. But it's, as far as the evidence goes, that's where I come down. No evidence either way. Tom, we have a question back here, actually. Sorry. Uh, I think as science is made easier for us to see that things aren't black and white, they do lots of shades of gray. You're not straight, you know, or, or gay, you're not male or female, everything's a sliding scale. And I think maybe with determinism, the PR downside of it is it lets people go, well, damn, I have no free will, and I can't change a thing. And maybe on the counter side, we live in a society, especially in America, that says you're poor, the probability of you ever getting out of your social classes is small, but you focus on that, that, that hope, that chance, that's what you focus on. Do you feel maybe that in the PR aspect of determinism, if it was pitch more as predictivism, that we focus on the probability of free will versus your situation, and that's better for children trying to understand that, that you have maybe a really low probability getting out of your stance, and that's what you should focus on, but obviously the chance, call it free will or whatever, it still remains as low as that probability may actually be. Right. We don't look at the people that determinism means that things don't change or can't change. They change all the time, and they change because of causation, right? So, and there is a probability that one can rise above one's original status by working hard. But the, again, if people have a bite of the myth, they could do it no matter what the conditions. Then this lets government off the hook. It lets us all off the hook in terms of arranging circumstances so that they do have a probability of getting out of their those circumstances. But you're right. Determinism is not a great word. It's got a lot of negative baggage. Causationism is one, one term that uh, someone suggested. Causation, uh, cause and effect, I can't do that. It says one minute, two minutes. So yeah, uh, the PR aspect of this is difficult. Uh, but I think it can be done. Uh, simply by understanding that change does not require independence or freedom from causation. Change is built into causation. And by knowing how change happens, that gives us power. Okay. Anyone else? I'll be right there. And then. On the idea of uh, empiricism as your source of, of knowledge, if we take a look at Francis Bacon, he said that um, our senses are um, not intact, uh, our powers of reasons are not intact, but you agree to. He says also nature is um, not. A trustable source, unless you poke it in product. Product, product is part of the uh, part of your empirical process. Does that enter into where you get your? Is that as empiricism make you skeptical? Um, what do you do? How do you how do you know that you can trust nature? Right. Well, that comes from repeated testing, which is the scientific method. You never do an experiment once. You do it several times. You control for as many variables as you can. You get your peer group to review it. And that is how you get reasonably sure, not completely sure, of course, that nature is behaving the way she, she really does. But you can never be completely sure. So yeah, uh, we don't want to get too high on the horse, but of course that's, that's the whole point of science. It's self-directing. I only have a couple, about 20 seconds. There's, we shouldn't indulge in the natural fallacy, which is supposed to suppose that because something is the case, that therefore it should be. I'm not sure I quite understood your question. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you, as a scientist or as a researcher, were to find out facts about our mental state that could cause harm, do you have an ethical obligation to withhold them? Uh, that's an interesting moral question, and uh, I don't have a good answer to it. Again, there, there, are, things, there are things in tension, right? The doing, wanting not to do harm, and then wanting to know the truth. The truth about free will may be just such a question. And Tom, if we can, let's take uh, an extra 30, 45 seconds and answer the gentleman who's been waiting to ask a question. After uh, our having heard this talk, some of us may act more in accordance with the principles that you've laid out than we would have previously, and some of us may not. The principles of what? Well, you've, you've given us some advice, haven't you? Yep. Okay. okay. Well, principles I've laid out. Okay, yep. 
Yeah. So anyway, so what I'm saying is that some of us may do, you know, do things more in accordance with what you say, um, and some of us may not. But none of us will have any choice in the matter, correct? No, because we are choice-making creatures. Deliberating and choosing is what we do as human beings. Right now, you're, you're thinking about what I said. You're weighing it in your mind. That's what we do. You can't help but make a choice about what you believe tonight, this right. afternoon. All right. What is it for God? We don't know what your conclusion is going to be. I don't know. That's what I'm talking because I'm talking because I want to spread the meaning of naturalism. I don't know if it's going to be spread or not. I'm talking in order to make it spread, right? That's a choice. It's all coming out of who I am and my situation. So even though things I'm saying are fully caused, our choice making, our actions, all remain as they, in the sense, they're just as powerful, they're just as effective. And because we don't know what's going to happen, therefore we act. If, if we were gods, we'd have no reason to behave because we would know the future. We don't know the future. The future is epistemically closed. It might be metaphysically closed. But I'm sorry, I said it completely wrong. The future is meta epistemically open. That is, we don't know what's going to happen. It might be metaphysically closed, but it's epistemically open. We act as if and because our actions make a difference in the world. They make just as much of a difference as anything else. So there's no invitation to passivity or fatalism in any of this. We gain power, we gain control, we gain compassion. That's how we see it. All right, thank you. Thank you.